Oh, I've just heard it's been translated into another one, so we're up to 25. <laughs> Offers are coming in by the moment. Uh, yeah, I like to second everything that Tara said. It really is just a joy to be here, and it's one of these great things, isn't it? That it. The thing is, it is getting. People always lament, you know, wouldn't it have been better? Wasn't Austin better 20 years ago? But coming to this event, the truth is, it just gets better every year. I think, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's nice to be. Uh, Free from that elegiac, uh, that elegiac urge. Okay, so as soon as Tao told me about the theme of this year's festival, White Gold, I immediately saw what I wanted to talk about. Saw, not knew, or at least seeing was a form of knowing. And what I saw was this. one of J.M.W. Turner's late paintings. And so, some of you will, of course, have seen similar ones, either in London, when you've been over there at Tate Britain, or gathered together as these late Turner paintings were a few years ago, before the pandemic, at the, at the Getty in Los Angeles. So what's going on in this painting, in paintings like this? What's happening? Well, I'll put it very, very briefly. The broad arc of Turner's career is from depictions and recreations of maritime or historical scenes through a gradually increasing distinctness towards an almost annihilating blaze of gold white light. The tangible world of places, palaces, and things gives way to a blade of gold white light. The world dissolves into just this blaze of light and color, or to fit in with the other discarded theme, the external sea gives way to the sea within, the psychological sea within Turner's head. Or we can put it differently again, the same phenomenon. The, re the represented world dissolves so thoroughly that Turner seems to have arrived at a kind of proto-abstraction where the subject of the canvas is nothing less and nothing more than paint itself. That's an example of one. And all this was going on, not by the late 19th century, which would have been impressive in itself, but before 1851, the year of his death. I mean, wow. So it really is historically an incredible thing he was doing. But if he was, in this light, a proto-abstractionist, he remained in some ways a deeply romantic artist. Pure, be pure beauty for Shelley, was symbolized by Mont Blanc, the white mountain. But even that was too tangible or too physical a symbol for Shelley. And so in Adonais, his great elegy for Keats, he expresses the romantic yearning for ultimate transcendence in these terms. Heaven's light forever shines, earth, excuse me. Heaven's light forever shines, earth's shadows fly. And then these killer lines. Life, like a dome of many-colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity. I mean, wow, again. I mean, I say wow, but, uh, you know, I'm English, so whenever I, like, whenever I make an ecstatic point, I like to undercut it. So I have a great fondness for Philip Larkin's couplet when he brings out the impossibility of ever getting away from the corporeal. And this is this great little couplet. Shelley had a belly. <laughs> in Turner's case what we have I think is this staining the staining that Shelley mentions both giving way to and expressing that elusive white radiance of eternity and don't take my word for it uh, in his mad book his insane and wonderful book about Thomas Hardy this uh, in a section called the light of the world this is what D.H. Lawrence writes about 
a particular strain in art. And he said, it's reached its climax in our own artist, Turner. And he goes on to say this, ever taught Turner sought the light to make the light transfuse the body till the body was carried away, a mere blood stain became a ruddy stain of red sunlight within white sunlight. This was perfect consummation in Turner, when the body gone, the ruddy light meets the crystal light in a perfect fusion, the utter dawn, the utter golden sunset, the extreme of all life, where all is one, one being, a perfect glowing oneness. And then Lawrence goes on to say this, if Turner had ever painted his last picture, it would have been a white incandescent surface, the same whiteness when he finished as when he began, proceeding from nullity to nullity through all the range of color. That's Lawrence's very evocative description of that ultimate transcendent painting that Turner never quite got round to, to painting. So there we have it anyway, in a single passage, the two key words of our theme, white gold, and the idea of moving towards a vision of such purity that the corporeal gives way to a manifestation of spirit. And we can see this, of course, in Turner's most famous painting, the fighting temeraire being tugged to its rest towards a blaze of extinguishing sunlight. Now, this dissolution of the physical world in Turner's late works was seen at the time as a sign of gradually diminishing capacity, a symptom, as one critic put it, of senile decrepitude. As early as 1829, someone else claimed that, quote, Turner's pictures always look as if painted by a man who was born without hands. Pretty harsh. By 1838, uh, someone else said he was a talent running riot into frenzies. And I don't know if these verdicts seem premature. I mean, Fighting Temeraire was exhibited at the Royal Academy. Uh, then by the following year, by 1843, after seeing his painting Shade and Darkness and Light and Color, the poet Robert Browning concluded Turner is hopelessly gone. And even John Ruskin, his famous and most enthusiastic supporter thought that some of the later works were indolent and slovenly, and he regarded the paintings made after 1846 as indicative of mental disease or evidence of a gradual moral decline. <laughs> now what's happened is that with the passage of time, these same works came to be seen as kind of visible proof of an artist prepared in the rather hackneyed words of a recent biographer, to someone prepared to throw all caution to the wind. It's kind of a cliche, really. Freeing himself both from the material claims of the market and from the artistic claims of the day. Turner, we hear repeatedly, was determined to print as he to paint as he pleased without regard to convention or to the taste of his patrons. He was equally determined to get paid well for his work, if you like, to turn the pure white radiance of the paintings into the solid gold of maximum remuneration. And he felt free to do this partly because the market for art was changing, whereas patrons who'd commissioned works felt quite reasonably that the results should more or less conform to their expectations and specifications, there was now a small but steady supply of collectors, wealthy industrialists or merchants, such as Ruskin's father, they were willing to pay for works that he'd created independently. And dealers became increasingly important in facilitating sales eliciting the desired answer without phrasing the question as crudely as Turner himself, the cockney visionary whose negotiating strategy tended to consist of a single question. Ain't they worth more? 
That was how Turner tended to negotiate with his, with his uh, clients when he was dealing with them directly. Uh, like Beethoven, Turner was unbelievably mean about money. They were both very, very wealthy, these supreme transcendent geniuses, but they were just unbelievably uh, 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 bad to deal with. I like that sort of comparison. Anyway, the key point here is that that dematerialization that we see in the art, the dematerialization celebrated by the paintings bears witness to and is itself the product of specific material conditions. I think that's quite important to say. Now, Turner's dedication to capturing the transitory effects of light anticipated and was, of course, admired by the Impressionists, including Monet and Pissarro, both of whom saw his work in London in the 1870s. And they value exactly the qualities that, that were derided in the press. But popular jokes at Turner's expense, that it didn't matter whether the pictures were hung upside down, that a baker's tray spilled in the display of an art gallery might be indistinguishable from an actual Turner painting. These all suggested that he'd gone still further, had, in fact, as mentioned previously, somehow single-handedly moved into a realm of abstraction. This is from an older critic about Turner. Sky and water were equated with the paint itself, articulating the way that Turner both looks ahead to the era of abstraction, when paint becomes the subject of a canvas, and was somehow able to catapult himself beyond the surly bonds of art history, who came in the 20th century to be regarded more highly than the painter of mythical, historic and seafaring scenes that was so beloved by his Victorian contemporaries. And that surge towards abstraction seemed even more extreme for a very simple reason, which we'll talk about for a bit. As early as 1806, Joseph Farringdon deemed the Battle of Trafalgar as seen from the mizzen starboard shrouds of the victory, he thought it was very crude and unfinished. And this was an opinion tacitly endorsed by Turner himself, who reworked the painting and exhibited it again two years later. If Turner's paintings looked unfinished, writes one of his biographers, the question of finish was further complicated by the fact that he began to show works in his galleries that his con contemporaries generally accepted were unfinished and were frequently displayed as works in progress. That was something clearly underway well before the, the late phase of his career. That when the painter had a clear idea of the distinction between what had been completed and what was being displayed as a preview of what was to come. Then after his death, the outcome of resolving the many legal complexities of Turner's will and bequest, uh, in the end it was decided everything would be left to the nation. That meant that the distinction became harder to disdain between finished and unfinished works. Some of the late paintings, the paintings we're talking about, they looked abstract because they were unfinished. They'd been abandoned on the way to becoming less abstract. But this insubstantiation helped to sustain, substantiate, helped in fact to complete, if you like, the case for the artist's reputation as proto-abstractionist. Here we are again with that one that we saw before. And what happened is that in the 20th century, with the finished and unfinished paintings hung next to each other, the blurring between the figurative and the abstract, between the finished and the unfinished. Oh, we could get in a muddle here. That blurring between the finished and the unfinished consolidated the process of dissolution contained within the paintings. A catalogue entry of the Getty show that some of you might have seen, the, uh, the show that was de devoted to his late work, reads like this. Critics have been unable to agree 
Whether works like this, set, sun setting over a lake, painted in between about 1840 and 18, that is really uh, very, very wide, isn't it? 1840 and 1845. Whether works like this or are finished or have been abandoned in progress. Either the landscape has yet to emerge into view, is yet to come into existence, or as Heisman's wrote after seeing an exhibition in 1887, the landscapes in such works have been vaporized. In other words, that which is not yet becomes indistinguishable from that which was, which I guess is a pretty good working definition of eternity. But I tried one further qualification to the idea of Turner somehow becoming an abstract painter before abstraction had even been conceived. I can remember very clearly being here at that first Biennale that Tau, Tau mentioned, the year zero. Uh, it, was, it was the afternoon, and to quote a line from Grace Slick and Jefferson Airplane, I just had some kind of mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> this was shortly before Mark Roth Rathel's lecture on Heidegger, and um, with, what with one thing and another, it was an unusual talk in that it seemed, <laughs> this may have been because of the mushroom, it seemed simultaneously to last about 10 minutes and 10 years. <laughs> Either way, when the lecture ended and I left the building and stepped up over that dike to look at the still expanse of the Stalt Salton Sea, I found that the world had vanished. There was nothing but a kind of shimmer of pure cloud streak light and sea and sky. Uh, they were reflected and merging into each other, as in this photograph, by none other than our great leader, Tyrus Bully. Now seen in this light, what I'm trying to suggest is that Turner's visions are not abstractions, but they're kind of scrupulously realistic re re renderings of something. Something? Well, of what? Uh, of a phenomenal world at the very moment that it came into being, or, well, it's Bombay Beach, or that it comes to an end. And there's one other practical detail or fact that we should take account of, I think, when we're discussing this peculiar phase of Turner's late work. I mean, as he aged, all critics remarked on this tendency for the canvases, canvases to be dominated by the by the color yellow. Yellow became the dominant color in his palette. And there are various explanations for this, one of which points to the development of his cataracts, which seem to, some people suggest, this resulted from his lifelong habit of staring into the sun. In other words, what happened is his eyes, in order to protect themselves, formed their own shields which clouded his vision, causing it to yellow in the way that nicotine can stain yellow the white hairs and fingers of elderly habitual smokers. So now what I want to do is go back to that um, line of Lawrence's that I quoted at the beginning when he says, it's a weird thing to say, if Turner had ever painted his last picture, this idea that somehow he never managed to paint his last picture, but he must have done. That he never quite achieved the apotheosis that his work, as many of those commentators we've quoted, seemed always to announce. So in this way, Turner remained condemned to the corporeal of this painting, Norham Castle Sunrise from about 1845, Lawrence writes that only the faintest shadow of life stains the light is the last word that can be uttered before the blazing and timeless silence. And consciously or not, it seems to me, Lawrence seems here to be echo echoing those lines of Shelley that we quoted. And Lawrence's suggestion that Turner never painted his last picture can also be viewed as a projection onto the artist and his canvases of the viewer's experience of looking at them. A friend of his 
put, put it very simply. You never get to the end of, end of a picture of his, she said. So I ask you to keep all of this in mind as we consider a particular picture, this one. This is, uh, the name of this painting is Regulus, first shown in 1828, subsequently reworked and exhibited in 1837. And the painting has its origin in those stories that uh, Turner had a great fondness for. There was a Roman co consul called Regulus, captured by the Carthaginians during the First Punic War, and he was allowed to return to Rome to arrange an exchange of prisoners. Um, and when he got back to Rome, Regulus advised against such a deal, and then he went back to Carthage to convey the news to his captors. And if they were impressed by the way that he'd honored the terms of his provisional release, this did nothing to prevent the Carthaginians expressing their extreme displeasure at having their offer rejected. So they really, uh, they really went to town on him. They cut off his eyelids, so, so that his eyes were roasted by the sun of North Africa, and that was just for starters. Lidless in Carthage, Regulus ended up sealed in a spiked barrel and rolled around the city for his pains. Ouch. <laughs> There's been some debate as to which of the small figures in this painting might be Regulus if he's there at all and whether the scene depicted shows him not on his return to Carthage but about to leave for Rome with his eyelids intact. We don't have to choose between these two options. Freed from documented chronology from before or after freed from before or after the painting collapses and contains the whole narrative to vicariously recreate for the viewer the subjective experience of what we know will befall Regulus and what is known to have befallen him. Even if he is setting out for Rome, this is a detail from the bottom corner, the barrel is being rolled out for his eventual return. Meanwhile, the sun is starting to obliterate everything. It's like the planetary source of a kind of macular degeneration that leaves only the periphery of vision more or less intact. At the center, as we can see here, everything is bleached out and that white gold sun will eventually consume more and more. So the picture really depicts a classic and recognizable Turner mytho-historical scene in the process of being burned away, of having all the identifiable props, buildings, people, leaving everything vaporized so that we're left with the all but featureless blaze that remains uniquely Turnerian. Stand here for a while, the picture insists, and more and more of what you see will be obliterated by that which enables you to see, thereby echoing the mock concern of the critic in Blackwood's magazine who wondered if Turner's eyes had, quote, been put out by the glare of his own colors. So the painting can be seen to represent in diagrammatic and dramatic form, painting represents in diagrammatic form the trajectory of Turner's art which culminates in or boils down to the blinding scorch and glare. After this you'll be left with something like sun setting over a lake, a very extreme painting made between 1840 and 18, uh, 1845 but close in every way I think you'll agree to that last painting imagined or retrospectively prophesied by Lawrence. Now since Lawrence raises the idea that Turner never painted his last painting, and since we've ended up back with the very first painting we looked at, I think we can ask when the potential for that last painting became apparent. 
I wonder, can we extrapolate backwards from that unachieved apotheosis to a moment when such a possibility was first suggested? And it's quite interesting, I think, to, to imagine, is there a moment, if you like, when eternity began, when these visions of eternity that we get in Turner first made themselves felt? And one of Turner's earliest patrons complained that late Turner, that Turner as an old man, and I quote, paints now as if his brains and imagination were mixed upon his palate with soap suds and lather. <laughs> now I knew vaguely about Turner, but I only became properly interested in him when I read an essay in About Looking in which John Berger, a writer who means a, meant a great deal to me, still does, uh, Berger does a very simple thing. He's trying to account for this weird quality of uh, Turner's late works. And he reminds us that Turner's dad ran a backstreet barber shop in London. And without offering a kind of definitive causal analysis, Berger just writes this passage. So just remember how important it is that Turner's dad was a, a barber, ran a backstreet barber shop. This is Berger. Consider some of his later paintings and imagine in the back street shop, water, froth, steam, gleaming metal, clouded mirrors, while bowls or basins in which soapy liquid is agitated by the barber's brush and detritus deposited. Consider the equivalence between his father's razor and the palette knife, which despite criticisms and current usage, Turner insisted upon using so extensively. More profoundly, at the level of childish phantasmagoria, picture the always possible combination suggested by a barber's shop of blood and water, water and blood. So I think in that fantastically evocative and suggestive passage by Berger, it seems that Turner's late painting that late painting as conceived by Lawrence was simmering in his consciousness when he was a little boy before he'd even painted his first painting. In other words, that white gold of eternity was rooted in stuff that he saw at a particular time and in a particular place as a little boy. His father's boy, the barber. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>